Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Discovery Days here at the uh, Canadian Medical Hall of Fame and Western University. We're so excited to have you joining us this morning. We also have an award for second year medical students up on the screen are all the people who have won that award from Western University. Um, you can see that it's a newer award. They're obviously not laureates of the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame, but these people also are called out for their excellence. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll see you up there one day. All right, that's my housekeeping side. I get the pleasure now of introducing, turning the whole thing over to our partners at Western and introducing Dr. Jane Garland, who uh, has held leadership roles um, in physiotherapy for decades now, uh, has both you know, her degree, her master's, her PhD in this field, and has contributed significantly um, with her own research to this field and is coming to you at today, speaking with the hat of the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences. Over to you, Dr. Garland. Thank you, Lisa. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Jane Garland, as you've heard, and I am the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Western. And on behalf of Dr. Alan Shepard, our president, and Dr. John Yu, the Dean of the Schulich Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, I welcome you to Discovery Days in Health Sciences. It's inspiring to see so many young people interested in learning about opportunities that exist in health and the many ways that research can add to our understanding of important health-related issues. I'm a researcher in the areas of uh, motor control and stroke rehabilitation. And I've dedicated my life to making discoveries that improve the health of others. And I developed this passion for discovery many years ago, and it grew out of interactions such as these with people who are already working in the field. It's my sincere hope that today's activities, that you will feel inspired by something or someone, and it sparks a similar passion in you. As you've seen on full display over the last two years, when the world finds itself in a crisis, it is evidence-based health knowledge, along with the talents of skilled clinicians and professionals that become critically important. When things <clears throat> that some of us take for granted aren't available, such as clean drinking water, access to medication, or functioning hospitals, we quickly see the many ways their absence can affect our lives and our health. We also see that health is so many things. It extends well beyond the absence of disease. It is technology and innovation. It's education. It's societal policies. Health means different things to different people around the world but it is something that also connects us all. Today, you will hear from researchers and leading experts from different areas of study at Western and the broader London community. These people are physicians, social workers, engineers, occupational therapists, chemists, audiologists, and more. And they are all connected by a shared commitment to creating healthier tomorrows for people close to home and around the world. I hope they can help you learn more about what health means and the role we all play in a thriving health system. Again, welcome to Western and welcome to Discovery Days in the Health Sciences. It is also my pleasure to introduce the Dr. Cecil and Linda Rohrbeck keynote lecturers. Dr. Priscilla Lang is a, radiologist, a radiation oncologist at the London Health Sciences Centre and an assistant professor at Western University in the Department of Oncology. She treats head and neck, lung and soft tissue cancers of the bones, cartilage and muscle. Her PhD focused on image guidance for medical devices. Her research interests include prediction models in oncology 
and translation of research tools into the clinical environment. Dr. Sarah Matinen is an assistant professor at Western University in the Department of Medical Biophysics with a cross appointment in the Department of Oncology. Her research interests include developing, evaluating, and translating image analysis tools to support diagnosis, treatment, and response assessment in oncology. These imaging models will assist clinicians in decision making and allow for personalized medicine with the goal of improving outcomes for cancer patients. The title of their, of their presentation is, Can We Stack the Deck? Using Imaging Data to Guide Clinical Decision Making. Please join me in welcoming Drs. Lang and Matinen. Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. I'm very happy to be able to be here today and uh, share a little bit about what uh, Sarah and I are doing. I'm going to start and then um, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah about halfway halfway through our, our talk. Um, so I thought I would introduce a little bit about what a radiation oncologist does um, because it's not a job that's uh, very commonly known and not a lot of people know much about radiation oncology. So I'm basically a cancer doctor and my tool is radiation. So I treat cancers with radiation um, and as Dr. Garland said, um, I have a specialization in treating head and neck cancers, lung cancers, and soft tissue cancers. Um, and, you know, half of all cancer patients will receive radiation as part of their treatment. And it can be given as um, the main treatment to try to cure a cancer. It can be given before or after surgery to prevent cancers from coming back. And sometimes it's given as a palliative treatment, a symptom control treatment to help with pain and bleeding and other problems. Um, so this is a picture of what we call a LINAC and that's a radiation delivery machine. And so you can see there's a patient who's lying on the treatment table and the machine moves around the, treat, the, the patient and, and that's how the radiation is delivered. And there's lots of devices that are set up here and that's to make sure that we are positioning the patient so that we can treat the areas we want to treat and avoid treating the areas that, that we don't want to treat. And you know, this Discovery Days event is actually very near and dear to my heart because this is actually how I got my start towards becoming a radiation oncologist a long time ago. Um, and I was actually showing um, Lisa and, and Janice the other day um, I have, I still have my clipboard, um, and I'll show you guys here, uh, with the sticker of the workshops that, that I attended on that day. And um, the, the keynote speaker um, in 2004 actually gave a talk about how we can use imaging technology to make treatments in medicine more targeted. And I just found that super interesting, and it actually inspired me to look for a summer job. Um, so this is actually a picture of me very nerdy looking me um, in 2004. This was my first summer job. It was actually my first um, first job ever. And um, it was at the Robards Research Institute where they have um, they have a big imaging lab. And, and this was my, my supervisor, um, Terry Peters, who was kind enough to take me on. At the time, I, um, I didn't even really know how to turn on a computer because in, in 2004, electronic devices weren't quite, <laughs> quite as advanced as they are, as they are now. Um, and so he was kind enough to take me on and, and he later became my, my PhD supervisor. And um, of course it's um, been a bit of a journey. So I, I did a degree in mechanical engineering. Um, and at the time I knew that I was interested in biomedical engineering. And then I did a, a um, combined MD PhD program and then I chose radiation oncology. And it, it kind of sounds very straightforward but there were a couple blips on the way. I almost took a job doing something completely unrelated um, I almost became a cardiac surgeon rather than a radiation oncologist. And so all that to say it's 100% okay if you don't know what you want to do right now. That's why we have events like this so that you can explore, try things out, um, and you know, see, see what's out there. So this is what a, a radiation plan looks like. I've shown you a couple examples here. Um, radiation works by damaging the DNA of cells and it causes an injury to cells. And normal tissues are able to repair themselves and heal. 
and cancer cells don't have that ability. And so when they're injured by radiation, they die. And so that's how we can use radiation to, to treat cancers. And radiation treatments are very targeted. So you can see here with the, the colors, it's kind of showing you the dose. So the red is sort of a bigger dose area. And then as the colors get cooler, we're going into lower doses and then, um, and then nothing beyond that. And so this is an example of a lung cancer being treated. It's very targeted. We wanna treat the area we want to treat. We wanna treat, avoid treating areas like the normal lung, like the important structures like your esophagus or your spine. Um, and so there's a lot of physics and math that goes into designing, designing these treatments. And if we can avoid treating the normal tissues, we can um, prevent giving people side effects from, from the treatment. Um, a lot of confusion about radiation oncology. So a few things that I am not, I'm not a radiologist. Radiologists also use images, but they use them to make diagnoses rather than planning treatments. Um, I'm not a medical oncologist. A lot of people um, pure oncologist and they think I give chemotherapy. That's the job of a medical oncologist. And I'm, I'm not a CT tech, um, but, but so, you know, what am I? And, and so I'm a physician and a lot of people think I spend all my days um, seeing patients. And, and that's partly true. I probably spend about half of my time um, seeing patients. And then uh, the rest of the time, I'm, I'm partly, you know, a scientist. I do a lot of research and I work a lot with, with Sarah Matnan. Um, which you're going to hear from, from later. And then I'm also partly a teacher. We have lots of medical students coming through. We have medical residents. Um, we have undergraduate students, graduate students in our area. So we also spend a lot of our time um, doing that. And so I, I've shown you here an example of um, what we do. So this image here actually shows you this is a cancer here. So this is the back of somebody's mouth. This is their tongue. You can see a tongue depressor here. This is the, their top teeth, and this is the back of their throat. And um, this is a normal looking tonsil. You can see a nice tonsil arch here, and then this side, there's a cancer. And so that's what we're, we're treating. And um, a lot of tonsillar cancers and cancers of the back of the throat are now actually associated with a virus. It's uh, called the, the HPV virus. And these um, cancers can be treated with radiation, usually given together with chemotherapy. Patients come every day, they get 35 treatments, five days a week for seven weeks. And it's actually a really tough treatment. We give people a lot of side effects. Um, they can develop a burn on their skin, which you see here, which can be very painful. They can develop burns on the inside of their mouths. And um, because it hurts so much, they can't really eat or drink. So that's why a lot of people need a feeding tube. And that's it's, it's um, not a permanent feeding tube for most people. It's temporary, but um, it can be very uncomfortable. It's very hard to eat. And then patients get a lot of side effects that are um, somewhat permanent. They might be permanently feeding tube dependent. They get changes to their taste where nothing tastes right. They, they have changes to their speech. Um, and all of that can really change your quality of life and it makes it hard to uh, go out and be with your friends. It can impair how well you feel psychologically. It can impair your ability to be an independent person. So um, those are very significant side effects from, from treatment. And um, we get those side effects because we're giving such a big dose of, of radiation. And one of the things that we've found recently is that maybe these, ca these cancers that are associated with a virus actually don't need such a big dose of radiation. Uh, we know that when we treat patients like the one that I, I showed you, 80% of people will be cured. 10% uh, of people might need a permanent feeding tube and about seven to 8% of those people will have a stroke later on. Um, and, and one of the problems is that we don't know who these people are. These are numbers, they're statistics. And, you know, we have a group of people here. And, and really what we want to do is pick out the people who are blue. These are the people who maybe won't be cured of their cancer and they need the higher dose. And maybe everybody else, we can, we can give them less treatment and still cure them and save them some, some side effects. So, you know, the questions are really, can we give less dose? Can we use smaller volumes? Can we give them less chemotherapy? And, you know, as, as a physician, a lot of my job is, is kind of like fortune telling. Patients always want to know, am I going to recur? How long am I going to live? And they want to know what's going to happen to me. And, and all I can tell them are these statistics that, you know, two out of eight, eight 
two out of 10 people might not be cured. Eight out of 10 people are going to be cured. And, and people really want to know, but, but what's going to happen to me? Um, and, and so a lot of times I, I feel like my job is um, kind of um, like placing bets. I'm trying to decide who am I going to give big treatments to? Who am I going to give uh, different kinds of treatments to? And um, I'm trying to place a bet on how likely I think I'm going to cure them, how likely I think I'm going to give them um, a side effect. And so, you know, you know, I always think of it as a little bit like um, being at a casino and, and placing, placing bets and trying to make a guess as to what's going to happen in the future. And so we start to ask questions like, how can we do that better? And if you had a model that could tell us what's going to happen in the future, or even what's more likely to happen in the future, how can we use the information we have to kind of stack the deck in our favor and um, help us make predictions that are more accurate for any given person and, and give them a very specific prediction about what's going to happen to them. And, and so these are the questions that I'm interested in. Um, can we use in imaging data and other clinical information to predict what's going to happen to somebody, whether they're going to have a cancer recurrence, whether they're going to live for five years, whether they're going to um, have problems being independent and have to move in with family or need support from, from family, or are they going to be okay to be independent and look after their own meals and um, look after their own home? And if we have a prediction that can, a model that can create these predictions, how do patients and physicians want to use that kind of model? Uh, a lot of patients say to me, well, I don't really want to know what's going to happen because maybe what's going to happen is going to be really scary and I don't want to think about that right now. So if we have a model that can give us all this information, how are we going to use it and think about it and how can we make that um, a, a compassionate and a kind model and tool that patients can use? And, you know, nothing in science and nothing in medicine is, is perfect and sometimes our predictions are going to be wrong. And how do we make sense of that? How do we use that information? Um, so those are the, the, the kinds of questions that I'm, I'm interested in. Um, I work as part of the team and, uh, you know, Sarah Matnan's kind of the other, the other big half of our, our group here. So I've shown you a little bit, uh, a photo of our, our lab area. So all of our students and um, our research assistant kind of lives in this area. This is Sarah's office, this is mine. Um, our research lab is actually located at the cancer center right above the clinics and right above where the radiation treatments actually actually delivered. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Sarah and let her talk a little bit about um, some of the research that's going on in the lab. Great. Thanks, Pencilla. I'm going to switch my screen. Okay, so I hope everybody can see that okay. Um, so thanks, Pencil, that was a great introduction and thanks for the opportunity to speak with everyone. We're really excited that you're all here today. So my name is Sarah Matnin, um, as Dr. Berlin mentioned. So I'm actually an imaging scientist. So I work closely with many doctors, including Dr. Lang. Um, but what exactly do I do? So she showed a picture of our lab and I'm gonna start with that as well. So I develop software and computer models to analyze images and build predictive models. Um, so sometimes when you think of a scientist, you think of test tubes and petri dishes, but really there's many different types of scientists. So I'm a computational scientist, which means I really only need my computer to do the type of research that I do. So this here um, is our dry lab. Um, so just high performance computer computers and allows us to view and process our data. So as Dr. Lang um, might have mentioned, our lab is located at the London Regional Cancer Program. So really this is essential. We wanna answer clinical questions like Dr. Lang mentioned, so um, it's great that Dr. Lang's office is right next to mine and we can chat about different questions and see what kind of tools we can use to help her solve some of her uh, questions. So what do we do? So when a cancer patient comes in to the clinic, um, they have all of this information available to them that Dr. Lang is gonna use to determine what the best treatment is. So our lab really tries to focus on the imaging data. So how we can get more information out of this standard medical images. So what do I mean by that? So let's first talk about some of the images that a patient may get during their treatment. And Dr. Lang introduced one of these earlier. Um, so one is a computed tomography or CT image. 
And a CT image, you can think about it, is a three-dimensional x-ray. So the patient's going to lie here on the bed, and this is the CT scanner here. So rather than getting one single picture with an x-ray, what we're going to do is take many pictures, put these together to form a three-dimensional image of actually what's going on inside our body. So inside this machine here, there's an x-ray source and across from it's a detector. And this is actually going to rotate around the patient. So you can see on this example here on the right, um, it's going to rotate around and it's going to give us a little slice of information through the patient. And we call this the beam here and it's going to give us information um, in this area of the body. So we can think of this like um, a slice of bread. So what we really want to do is we want to get multiple slices of bread, put those together to create a whole loaf. Um, so how we do that is the table is actually going to move through the CT scanner. So it's going to take images of this patient across the whole body. So just like a, putting slices of bread together to create a loaf, we're going to take images of the patient, put those together to make a 3D image. So Dr. Lang showed you an example of what one of these looked like uh, before, but I'll just go into a little bit more detail. So here um, we can see the bed that the patient's lying on here at the back. This is going to be the front of the patient. This is the back, their spine. Um, the dark regions here are their lungs and we can see a tumor here on the left side of your screen. So since x-rays are absorbed differently by different tissues in the body, this allows us to really visualize the different anatomy. So since tumors um, are solid, they're gonna absorb those x-rays and they're gonna show up as bright, whereas the lungs, they're gonna let the x-rays pass through, so they're gonna show up as dark. So CT is a really valuable tool to help visualize lung cancer. But recall I mentioned this is a 3D image and we're only looking at a single slice. So here's an example of a CT in 3D. So we're gonna scroll through now and it allows us to see the whole body or the whole chest, I should say. So we're moving up towards the patient's head. You can see the airway here. So now we're getting to the top of the lungs. Here are the shoulders. We're gonna go back down. So we're again, going through the lungs, follow the airway, keep your eyes open for that tumor that was over here uh, coming into your into view here in a minute. There it is and there it goes. And we work our way down towards the patient's feet. So you can see the CT image gives us a lot of information and a lot of detailed information about what's going on inside the body, specifically the lungs. So when a lung cancer patient is being diagnosed, so they're going to get a CT scan and they're also going to get what's known as a positron emission tomography or PET image. And what a PET image is, is actually showing us how active the tumor is. So for this image, uh, the patient's going to be injected with a small amount of a radioactive sugar. So this is called a tracer. And we know cells in our body absorb the sugar. So areas that use more energy pick up more of this sugar. And cancer cells, they're uh, growing fast. They need a lot of energy. So they're going to show up as bright regions on the PET image. So it shows us where the radioactive tracer is uptaked uh, in our body. So it's really good at showing us if cancer has also spread or metastasized to other regions. Um, and because it just tells us how bright it is, we don't really get anatomy on it as well. So um, it always is taken at the same time as a CT scan. So you can see behind it, the CT scan and the bright image is the PET image overlay. So when a, a lung cancer patient comes in, they get a CT and a PET scan, but the radiologist is gonna take some basic measurements. So they might say that this tumor is three centimeters in diameter and this positron or emission tomography image has um, an uptake in the tumor of nine. So this is an SUV max, we call it, and it's a standardized uptake value. So this is really a value that tells us how bright that tumor is. But these images are 3D. So we have a lot of information here, and this is really where our research comes into play. So one of the areas that my lab focuses on is radiomics. So radiomics is a field of research which aims to extract quantitative information from standard medical images. So you might think radiomics, that's kind of a funny word, but you can kind of think of it compared to genomics. So genomics, genes, you have lots of genes. Radiomics, rad is radiology, the medical images, and it's just a lot of information about the images. So the basic idea here is we can take our images, we can define a segmentation, which just means we're gonna outline the tumor, for example, in our cancer patients. And then we're gonna extract a bunch of information from these images. So this is where our software tools and coding comes into play. So we're really what we're trying to do is pull features out of these images that a doctor might not see with their eye. So typically what we're trying to do is we're trying to put numbers to patterns that we see in the image. So from then we're gonna have hundreds and thousands of features that we can use to describe our region or our tumor. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use machine learning to try to make predictions. So some of these predictive models that Pencilla was talking about before. So what exactly is machine learning? You've probably heard of artificial intelligence or machine learning before, but when we think of machine learning, you can kind of break it down into the machine. In this case, it's gonna be a computer. 
And the learning is really just instead of us programming a computer to do something, it's going to learn how to do that. So what do I mean by that? We're going to give it all these different image features, and it's going to learn to predict which is associated with the specific outcome, for example. So is the cancer going to come back or not? So in this quick example, if we had two features, uh, we can plot all patients either maybe who recurred in blue and didn't recur in red. And what our machine learning classifier is going to do is try to find the line that best separates those two groups. Um, and we can use that as our predictive model. So really, the goal of our research is we want to take this imaging data from clinical decision making, move it to more of a computer aided decision support. So this is what Dr. Lang was talking about. So we can develop computer models, computer code or interfaces that we can give to a clinician to help them with their decision making. So we work really closely back and forth with clinicians in terms of what information they want to see and how we can provide that to them to really help um, in their decision making. And I want to mention our goal is to never replace a doctor with AI or machine learning. What we want to do is we want to help them do their job either quicker or more accurately. So give them tools that they can work with really so that we can have a best impact on patients, um, cancer patients in the future. So I'm just going to go quickly over um, one example of that we're working on in the lab right now. So uh, about the computer aided decision support system that we're developing for lung cancer. So this here is our workflow that I showed before, and I have a PhD student, Jared, who's working on this right now. So he's extracted a bunch of these radiomic features from CT and PET images of lung cancer and combine that with some clinical information. So we know of the patients, how old they are, if they're a past smoker. So we can combine this with our machine learning model to predict if the patient's going to have a recurrence or not. So what did we find? We looked at CT and PET. So here's two patients, one patient on the top row, one patient on the bottom, the CT, PET, and then the fused PET. So it's just an overlay uh, fusion. Recall that SUV max value, they both had the same that we talked about before was 10. Oh, so what we found was that we were able to find image features that predicted which patient was going to recur. So this patient recurred on the top and this patient didn't recur on the bottom. And we found that it's to the texture in these regions. So the texture around the tumor, so you can see almost these spikes tend to indicate the patient's going to recur. And if they see more variegated intensities or kind of more speckled pattern in the pet image, that's also not a good sign. And it, sound, it seems like that those patients are recurring. And then finally, we also looked at not just the tumor. So this is a little bit of a different view from a PET scan here, um, but you can see the bot patient's body quite out easily outlined. And here's the big tumor in the lungs. So what we've also done with our software tools is we've looked at regions outside of the tumor. And you can see here the spine shows up really dark on our PET image. And we've actually shown that image features in this region can also help in our predictive models. So we're really trying to use 3D information, both the tumor and other regions of the body to try to build predictive tools get more information out of these images to really help uh, Dr. Lang and other doctors uh, in their decision making in terms of providing the best treatment possible. And I won't go into it in detail today, but we're also looking at head and neck cancer, as Dr. Lang mentioned. So this is a patient with a cancer at the back of the throat. So again, a CT scan, you can see the back of the neck here. Here's the jaw. Um, these are just three different views of the CT scan. So this is the same sort of view that like a slice of bread that we saw earlier with the lung but this is in the neck and the tumor here is outlined in red. So as Dr. Lang mentioned, we're trying to develop tools that we can help uh, give her to determine who might need a feeding tube, who's gonna, cancer's gonna come back um, and answer all those different questions as well. So it's not just focused on one cancer site, um, but a bunch of different ones. So that's a little bit about what um, I do in the lab and what my research looks like day to day. Uh, but I'm gonna last, end off with the last minute here in terms of just how did I get to where I am? So Dr. Lang gave you a bit of a background um, in terms of where she got to where she is. So I'm going to give you a little bit about my story. So I grew up in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and then moved to Newmarket, Ontario. I decided I wanted to, I knew I was always interested in cancer. I didn't really know what I wanted to do kind of going into university. So I decided to come to Western and entered the Bachelor of Medical Sciences program. Uh, so this gave me a lot of options to try new courses, try different areas, and really find out what I was interested in. So at the end of this degree, again, I still wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do cancer. Um, didn't really have a lot of research experience in undergrad, so I just kind of was researching different careers and came across radiation therapy. So I decided to go to the Mitchner Institute in Toronto, it's an affiliated program with U of T, to do a Bachelor of Science in Radiation Therapy. And this is a person who works closely with Dr. Lang to actually treat the patients with radiation. So they see the patients every day, it's a very clinical role in terms of setting up the patient, delivering the radiation, and you really get that um, interaction with the patient on a day-to-day -day basis. So during this degree, I um, did a, a research program 
placement at Princess Margaret Hospital. And really, this is where I fell in love with the discovery and trying to figure out, to realize that we can use research and discovery to um, develop new technologies and really advance um, patient care. So that's when I decided I wanted to go back into research, came back to Western to do my PhD um, with Aaron, Dr. Aaron Ward, an imaging scientist, and Dr. David Palma, a radiation oncologist. And that's really where I developed, started my research in image analysis and machine learning. So I knew I wanted to pursue a career in research long term, so I decided to go do a postdoctoral fellowship, which is just another period of extended research um, at Stanford University. So I spent two and a half years down in Palo Alto, California, which was a great experience to get a new environment um, and a new research experience. And then I came back to Western, now here where I am now as an assistant professor um, in the Baines Imaging Lab and Medical Biophysics. Um, and it, on a day-to-day -day basis, get to work with amazing students. So we do a lot of research, a lot of teaching, um, and that's kind of where I am now. So I'm going to end off there. So we have a few minutes for questions. I saw some popped in the chat, um, but thanks so much for listening and we'd be happy to take any questions. Wow, that's, uh, you guys are blowing my mind a little bit. That's uh, really incredible. Um, I love the, uh, the, the, the demonstration of um, the clinical work with the, I guess, the, the scientific uh, math application to try and solve and treat cancer. It's amazing. Um, there are some questions in the chat. We just have a few minutes. There's two things I want to um, point on. One of the questions, and we often get this from students, is in high school, what are you studying now that makes you do what you're doing? And and I know <laughs> I know the answer to a certain degree because really you got to get to university. That's what you need to be focused on in high school is getting into the program in university you want. Nothing you're studying in high school will make you a radiation oncologist or the scientist that Sarah is. But what did you focus on in high school? What did you love that informed what you chose to do for your for your university degree? So. You know, I, I saw some questions about sort of training and education and, and flexibility in the in the chat. Um, when I was in high school, I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea that I wanted to be a radiation oncologist. I um, actually made made a lot of changes to what I wanted to do as we went, went there. I, I always knew I was interested in science. I took a lot of courses in science and engineering. Um, I debated whether I was going to do science or engineering as an undergrad. I picked I picked engineering. Um, and I always knew that I wanted to work with images. I knew that I found that really interesting. I knew that I liked something in the medical field. Um, I didn't know if I was going to be an engineer that kind of built the tools that physicians use, or if I was actually going to be a doctor. And then once I went into medicine, I didn't know if I was going to be a radiologist or if I was going to be a surgeon. Um, those were, I, I kind of made a lot of uh, switches on the, on the way there. And um, I think there, there is a lot of flexibility in, in changing what you do. Most of us who went to medical school, um, when we started medical school, what we said we wanted to do was not the same thing as what we ended up ended up doing. Um, you know, so I think, you know, a lot of times high school students feel very set and like, I need to make the right decision now so that I end up where I want to be. Um, but I don't think that was really the path for any of us. It's sort of like you, you try something, you figure out whether you like it, and then you, you try something different. Right. So keep an open mind, right? And keep your mind open to learning different paths. Sarah, I'll turn it over to you before we wind up to uh, to also answer that. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. So I completely agree with Pencilla. I think in high school, I kind of, I took a little bit of everything. I took all the science courses. I didn't really know what, and I think at that stage, I also didn't know what the opportunities were that were available. So I find when you go into undergrad, you really, that's your chance to try new courses, really look at the different departments, look at different areas, try a course you might not have thought you might like, that's where you kind of are going to learn and kind of discover new things. So it's okay that you don't, if you don't know what you want to do, I, as you saw from my path, I also didn't really know and kind of it changes and that's okay. Um, as you keep going and trying new things, you find out what you like, what you don't like. Um, and that's great. And it kind of gets you to where you are in the end, even if it takes a little longer sometimes, which is okay. Wonderful. Well, listen, thank you both for the time that you've given us today. You're clearly very busy people, but you still made time for this and we really appreciate it. Thanks very much, everybody.